Okay, my topic is related to a lot of talks I have heard uh, in these uh, two days. Uh, I'm talking about the Confucian education uh, as civic education. I changed the word from and to as to make it a little bit stronger connection uh, to the theme of the conference. So um, my talk has mainly two parts. One is uh, to introduce, explain Confucian education, what it is about and uh, the, uh, the content, and then uh, make a connection uh, between Confucian education with the civic education. Uh, in Confucian philosophy, uh, education is usually expressed in the term of jiao xue, the two terms used together. And the uh, first word jiao literally means teaching or educating others. Xue means learning or educating oneself. The two terms are often coupled together to refer to education in a general sense. And uh, that shows the connection between learning and teaching. Now, uh, education occupies a central place in Confucian philosophy. And earlier Confucian thinkers were teachers, and uh, when they established the philosophy, they put education at the very center of their philosophy. On the Confucian uh, conception, a human person is not a biological concept. We are not born a full person. Humanity is something we develop, something we cultivate, we gain in our educational process. So this is a passage from the Confucian classics, the Book of Rights on learning, there is a section, there is a chapter on learning. It says that jade does not become a product without a carving. People do not understand the Tao without learning. Therefore, ancient kings placed the jiao and the xue, teaching and the learning, as a top priority when they established the state and ruled the people. Earlier Confucians in the classical period think that human societies were established by those wise people they called the sage kings. And when they established society, they put education as a top priority. Learning is the first word of Confucius' Analects, the book that records Confucius' sayings. That's the indication of how learning is taken so seriously in the Confucian tradition. And the Confucians said that as human beings, we are born similar. However, it is through learning we become different. Some people learn more than others. Then gradually we create a distance between different people. Some people learn better, become more virtuous, better educated. Others are less so. So that's how people become different in society. We, we are born with the same potential, but how we realize the potential is not always the same for each person. Mencius, the second greatest Confucian thinker in ancient times, uh, used the analogy of a plant. He says that when we were born, we each have this seed in us, this sprout in us, that allows us to grow into full development, full cultivation of the, our humanity. However, we need to cultivate those seeds, these sprouts, in order to, to gain full humanity out of us. Now, Confucius 
when he summarized his own lifetime, uh, his uh, um, uh, life experience, he said that at the 15, I set my heart on learning. That was the earliest uh, hallmark uh, major stage in his life stages. Until he said, until when he reached the 70, he feel free uh, to do anything he wished without crossing any boundaries. And that means he, feel, he, feel, he feels he's fully cultivated. He also put, you know, Confucian ethics is usually taken as virtue ethics. Ethics is focusing on cultivating human virtues. And Confucius himself takes the love of learning as a very important virtue. In the Analex, the concept of uh, love of learning or fun of learning uh, appears many times in many different sections throughout the book of Analex. And uh, when Confucius talked to his students, he is believed to have, uh, had, to have, uh, to have had uh, over 3,000 students throughout his lifetime. When he talked to his students, he said, uh, I'm not better than other people in many other ways, but I'm very much in love with learning, with learning. So learning is an important uh, virtue that Confucius wants to demonstrate for his students. Now, we can note a few features of Confucian learning. First, Confucian learning is not merely about acquiring theoretical knowledge, nor merely book learning. Learning is about improving oneself to become a better person. The primary purpose of learning is not to earn a comfortable uh, life. It is about learning to be an all-rounded, productive person for a good life in society. Second feature, learning is, not, is by no means a passive process of absorbing knowledge or information. It is rather an active endeavor to pursue knowledge and to acquire experience and skills. In his teaching, he encouraged Confucius encouraged his student to come up with three uh, cases when he presented one case. He said, if I show you a square and point it to one corner, if you cannot point, find out three other corners, we cannot go on. I cannot continue to teach you. So student initiative is important in his pedagogy. Third, Learning is not a one-directional dire affair. Uh, rather, it's a kind of a two-way street between the teacher and the learner. Confucius learned from his students, while his students learn from him. And Confucius believed that uh, if there are three people working together, at least you will find one person who can teach you something. So, uh, you can always learn from others. Confucius was among the very first in human history to advocate education regardless of a family background, without social classes. And the time he started uh, spreading his philosophy in China, mainly education was controlled by the state, it was for the state. And um, uh, for you know children of state uh, officials, and the Confucius advocated the idea that everybody deserves a chance to be educated, and that idea later uh, generated a great impact in China. And the later the civil service uh, examination practice is traceable directly to that idea that everybody has the potential to become a productive uh, person in society. In 
in terms of uh, Confucian curriculum, in his time, his uh, school curriculum uh, included mainly these six uh, items, rights, uh, in Chinese the term li. This term needs a little bit of inter interpretation. Uh, the, sometimes it's translated in English as ritual proper variety. It's, it's kind of basically, uh, in English, you will find many terms covering uh, aspect of it. We talk about the rice ceremony, we talk about the protocol, we talk about the etiquette, uh, we talk about uh, civility, we talk about uh, you, uh, you know, act with respect. All these things are covered in this broad concept of Li. Then music. Music was a major uh, item uh, he taught. Archery. Of all sport uh, skills, archery was chosen in part because Confucius believed that uh, this is a, a special kind of a sport. When you shoot an arrow, you miss the target. You don't blame others. You re reflect on yourself. What did I not do right? What I can do to improve? So there is a, uh, that uh, consideration in that item of archery. And uh, general tearing has to do with uh, military training and uh, uh, some skills in case you need to serve the state. Calligraphy, of course, that has a long tra there is a long tradition in China about calligraphy. And finally, mathematics. Uh, mathematics is um, also an important thing. As you can see, uh, in back in those days, there was no science in it. And um, uh, some people argue that later China did not develop a science as well as the West, perhaps because Confucian curriculum did not have science. Uh, you can equally argue that at that time, there was basically no science uh, to, to include, to be included here. Some of his disciples uh, classified the teaching, uh, the, the, what they learned from Confucius in four categories. One is the cultural refinement. And Confucius uh, very much emphasized the need for a person to, uh, to be refined culturally, to become a part of a culture. And we were born, we basically have no culture. And we need to learn the culture to become a part of the culture and the proper conduct. And that has to do with the earlier the concept that I mentioned, Li. You behave well. You interact with the people in a polite way, with respect, and be considerate, etc., etc. And then, uh, dedication. Whatever you choose to do, you set your heart on it and do it well. Be persistent and the trustworthiness. And trustworthiness is an important virtue uh, in the Confucian tradition as well. So uh, this is one way for his disciple to summarize. You can imagine different disciples may have a different ways to summarize his teaching. But this example shows some of the uh, key items that Confucius valued in his uh, teaching. Now we can see that the learning and the teaching are two aspects of a Confucian philo philosophy of education. Learning is for individual persons to observe knowledge, to develop social skills, and to become virtuous. Teaching is for those with knowledge and experience to help others grow. Of the two aspects of education, learning and teaching, Confucius advocates that one should learn insensibly and teach others tirelessly. For him, learning without teaching becomes 
blind. Teaching without learning is futile. Learning and teaching strength each other. Such a mutual dependency can be found in the same person. When we we when a person both learn and teach, it can also be between be between different people, between students and teachers. In learning, students not only improve themselves; they can also help their teachers to improve. The same can be said of teachers. When these two functions works together in mutual support and mutual enhancement, society can successfully reproduce good members for uh, its future, and the virtuous people will result through teaching and learning. So that's a brief summary of Confucian's、uh, philosophy of education. The second part, I wanted to make a connection to the Confucian philosophy of education、uh, with、um, uh, with civic education. If you look at the Confucian education from the perspective of civic education, you can see quite a bit of analogy with the ancient Greek practice. In ancient Greek, there is this、uh, agenda to reproduce people,、uh, citizens, for the poly to become good citizens of society. Now, if we look at the Confucian philosophy of education from that angle, then the question is. What can Confucian philosophy of education contribute to civic education in democratic societies, especially in East Asian societies? If we wish to educate people for productive and responsible citizens,、uh, then we need to think about、uh, on the. Side of civic education, what should be included in the curriculum? How we should teach our students? And this is、uh, in philosophy. This is a contentious issue because people don't agree on what、uh, educators should include in their teaching. And、uh, liberals tend to think that,、uh, at the most. In school, we should teach only public virtues, and private virtues should be left to students themselves. And in this regard, Confucian philosophy does not make a clear separation between private virtues and public virtues, and they think these two kinds of virtues are closely related. For future, future. Uh, good citizens of society, they will need both public virtues and、uh, private virtues. First, morality itself is relational. As long as one lives in society, there is no virtue that is completely isolated from others. In real life, so-called vir- private virtues directly or indirectly affect. Uh, a person's social、uh, participation, which is required by democratic、uh, society, and private virtues have a public dimension to it. Where some virtues, such as, such as respect and tolerance, are more directly relevant to civic participation, other virtues may relate to public life indirectly. They are also relevant. Second, in democratic participation, we cannot separate the right from the good sharply. There are some differences, but we still cannot separate them. As far as virtues are virtues, because they are conducive to the good life in the community in which one lives. Strictly speaking. What is considered as right, this is from a Confucian perspective, is also a form of good in society. Political freedom is a civic right. 
For example, it is also an important good in society. In this sense, civic education of civil rights is also a promotion of an important common good. Now, speaking of civic participation, civil participation, one important virtue for effective participation in democratic processes is civility, is civility. John Rawls put civility as a primary virtue uh, in, for democratic society. In this regard, I think Confucian philosophy of education can contribute uh, quite a lot because it's the idea of uh, Li, the concept I mentioned earlier, which is a thick notion and packed with uh, practice of civility in interacting with others. A person who is cultivated well in Li will be equipped well in interacting with others in a civic way. Yeah. Uh, in a civil way. And that is especially important in contemporary Western society and probably Eastern society when there is a big uh, divide, divide in society. We need to talk to each other in order to, um, in order to work together, to understand together. And um, that, in that regard, Confucian uh, philosophy of education has a lot to contribute because the Li is the primary virtue for Confucians. Now, here is a list of important aims or goals for Confucian educational philosophy in the Confucian classic text called Greater Learning. Greater Learning is uh, in contrast with uh, smaller learning or lower type of learning. Greater learning is more about being uh, prepared for good, good citizenship in society. And more has more to do with virtue. It includes these eight items. This is a list that comes from over 2,000 years ago. Investigate things, that's about knowledge we need to find out about our world, and extend knowledge. You find things, you, you dig deeper and find out more about it, and uh, develop a, a broader web of knowledge. And you need to have a good will, good will for yourself and a good will towards others. And set your, your heart right. Now, uh, Confucian, in Confucian virtues, uh, equally important with Li is the concept of Ren. Ren is humanity, humanist, or uh, empathy, sympathy, compassion, translated in different ways, and it covers a broad range of things. Setting the heart right is to have the right attitude towards other human beings, and you gain humanity of your own in treating others in the right way. And you continue to cultivate your person to improve yourself to develop virtues, and you uh, regulate family. This item is primarily in ancient time for men, for, for the head of a household. And uh, there is probably, arguably, some sexist bias there, I think. And um, today, we need to take a look at that, that sentence and uh, think about what to, to do with it. Then, participate in, uh, in government. And the Chinese civil service examination has a lot to do with that idea. But uh, I have been arguing that in democratic uh, times, uh, the primary goal for responsible students is not to serve in the government, rather to participate in democracy, to contribute to political process, to help the nation to go, the country, the society to go in the right direction. And finally, to, uh, 
and achieve harmony in the world. In our world. Now, why do I think a Confucian philosophy of education uh, can make a good contribution to civic education in today's democratic societies, even in multicultural societies? I think one important line to be drawn in contemporary multicultural societies is on religion. Because religion reaches the deepest level of human existence, it defines the human's identity in the most fundamental way. In today's multicultural society, civic education should be promoted in a non-sectarian fashion. In this regard, Confucian education is particularly suitable in working with other cultural traditions in promoting civic values uh, in a religious neutral way. And my argument in this regard is twofold. First, although Confucianism has its own religious components, it is not a religion. Confucius was agnostic of gods and avoided discussing uh, religion, supernatural things, with his students. In this regard, Confucianism is free from the most divisive element between religions. Second, and more important, we should make a conceptual distinction between Confucian values in the sense that the values that Confucius endorsed on the one hand, and the Confucian values in the sense of values possessed exclusively by Confucians. The latter category hardly exists. So when we talk about the Confucian values, we are talking about the values endorsed by Confucian philosophy. It's not monopolized by Confucian philosophy. The value system we call the Confucian is not unique to Confucianism, even though they are endorsed by Confucianism. They can equally be endorsed by other cultural traditions as well, as well. As we can see in the eight aims in the Confucian classics, the great learning, I imagine many different cultures can endorse these goals, even though they may not articulate exactly the same way or order them the same way. So in that regard, I think is non-religious background, or very, very little religious background, and is value are mostly common values. These are two accounts, uh, two accounts make a Confucian philosophy education a good candidate for today's civic education in particularly East Asian societies. In Singapore, I think the government is promoting values in terms of common values. Singapore is a multicultural, multi-religious society. But if you read the values, you can see basically every value on the list you can find in Confucian philosophy. Now, in closing, before closing, I do want to mention that Confucianism is an ancient tradition. It is a continually living tradition. As any other major world cultural tradition, Confucianism has its, its own historical baggages. And there are elements in Confucianism, the way it was articulated, are no longer relevant. Specifically, Confucianism has had a strong dose of sexism, and that is no longer uh, something we will embrace, and Confucianism has to, to, uh, to change in, on that account. And also, uh, the idea of, of filial morality, your duty toward your parents, and historically interpreted the way historically interpreted Confucianism put uh, 
larger burden on children, maybe too much on children. And today, in our liberal society, we probably will not go with it. So there is perhaps a more balanced uh, place of obligations within the family. So this sense that Confucianism needs to, uh, to change, and many contemporary Confucian thinkers are doing that uh, revision, basically. So in conclusion, I want to say that today we live in a democratic society, uh, in democratic societies, in a multicultural uh, social settings, and uh, we need to figure out how to promote civic education, and we need to draw from cultural resources, and Confucianism has a lot to offer in that regard. That is my presentation. Thank you very much.